Thanks very much, Yolanda. I'm excited to be here and to be part of this august group. Even more excited by the immediate security alert that comes up when I talk. This is part of my identity. Um, today I'll be talking about attitudes and actions towards immigrants, and I want to acknowledge my collaborators, Catherine Amio, who hopes to be here tomorrow, and her postdoc, uh, Marie-Lise Dusray, Emma Thomas, Craig McGarty, Fatali Mogadam, um, working with me on a grant on a related project, and Stephen Lamachia, my former PhD student and who contributed importantly to the analyses of the new studies presented here. So as you can see in these pictures, attitudes and actions towards immigrants are often tightly linked to the national identity, and the previous speaker alluded to that repeatedly through the talk. However people are acting towards immigrants, whether they're excluding them or welcoming them, they typically frame that exclusion or welcome in relation to the national identity. Canada, a country of immigrants, of refugees in one picture here, and um, US Border Patrol you know, needs our support in the top left corner. Now in terms of who I am, you'll see I wanted to mention I am an immigrant. Um, I was born in Canada, I grew up here in Toronto and Montreal. But I've been living in Australia for the last 16 years, and I'm based at the School of Psychology at the University of Queensland. And my research approach in general is to look at identities and norms. So I'm very interested in social rules or standards for behavior, and the idea that when people feel that they're members of groups, whether that's as social psychologists or as Canadians, their attitudes and actions often fall into line. But as you'll see through this talk, I'm um, interested in looking at the possibilities of both negative and positive social change. So this is just a flavor of the work that I've been doing in the last um, year or so. And I would just want to highlight for you that I'm interested in looking at action, collective action by disadvantaged groups, but I'm also interested in looking at how advantaged and disadvantaged groups work together. So the negative um, collective harm doing by advantaged groups, that they would impose exclusion or prejudice or rejection or violence on powerless groups, and then the positive allyship, the, the empathy-based, um, you know, the uh, reaching out positive contact, I really want to look across the spectrum of those um, attitudes and actions. And this talk, oops, sorry, getting carried away. This talk, I say, um, I want to ideally in the next um, 25 minutes <clears throat> cover um, how national norms for welcoming or excluding refugees are constructed and constructed in a particular way that I've become interested in the last few months. In a way that what I tell you about what the national norm is allows you to guess what my politics are. So when I tell you that the Canadian way is to welcome refugees, you immediately know that I'm a left-wing person and that that in turn makes salient your political identity. And the reason why that's important, because firstly, this architecture of clustered identities um, is theoretically um, not well elaborated, the idea that you'd have this, this positive correlation among a set of identities, but also that this in turn is the basis for counter-mobilization. And I've got some cool data from the immigration context um, uh, looking at counter-mobilization by left-wing people against discriminatory norms, but also by right-wing people against inclusionary norms. And if, if we have time, I'm going to talk about the radicalization of the anti-immigration movements around the world. So the social identity approach, as I think many of you would know, but why not ask, um, are there people here who don't know social identity? That's good, because I would have made fun of you. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's good because I'm not going to cover it in detail, and yet it's vital to the talk, right? Um, so the social identity approach implies that when you identify with important groups, you often act out the social norms of those groups. So for example, if you identify with Canadians, and if they have tolerant norms, then you would also welcome refugees. You would be pro-tolerance. And if you identify with Americans, then you identify with bigoted exclusionary norms, and therefore you too are probably an exclusionary bigot, including the people in this room. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> And uh, Donald Trump, there, I've said it, it's out in the open. No, I'm just kidding. Um, and so where do these discriminatory norms come from? How is it that uh, Americans might be become more bigoted, Canadians less so? Well, it would come from relative perceptions of threat in the social identity model along three dimensions. 
And for example, if you see that the refugees are illegitimate, that the boundaries are, of your country are permeable, and that the status of your country is unstable and we need to make America great again, then those would be the conditions when you would embrace discriminatory norms. And there is heaps of data to support this. But one of the things that I've become interested in the last year is how, in fact, multiple group identities can be relevant to your immigration attitudes. Not just your national norms, but your political orientation, your left and right wing norms, or your religious norms, your faith norms, or the norms of other communities, the Toronto, the Ontario norms. And how do we navigate those uh, multiple identities? And even in some of my... Um, old work on this. So for example, a publication with Angela Nickerson shown here, published in JASP, we showed both the traditional social identity effect and a multiple identity effect. So just revisiting, this is what you might call the traditional social identity interaction. It shows in the red line, this steep slope upward. And on the x-axis, although I realize since I'm sitting at the back that you can't actually read it at the back, on the x-axis is hostile norms. So as Australians are seen to be more hostile to refugees and, and immigrants, your own attitudes and actions become more hostile as well. These are negative attitudes and feelings on the y-axis. But that's only true for the red line if you identify strongly with Australia. And this black line on the bottom shows that you're not responding to those hostile national norms if you don't identify. So what are you responding to? Well, perhaps other identities, right? Faith norms or uh, political norms. And in that same data set, we actually showed people see, some people seem to be responding to it, what you might think of as the ultimate superordinate identity, the human identity. So this red line here in this graph um, shows people's negative attitudes towards asylum seekers. And on the x-axis is Australian identity salience. So now we're looking at a different two-way interaction. We're showing that as you identify more strongly with Australia, you become more hostile to asylum seekers. And that's only true, though, if you don't relate to asylum seekers or refugees as fellow human beings. So if you feel low human identity in this context. Now, if you identify strongly at that asylum seekers and refugees are fellow human beings, then you're on the green line. And even if you identify more strongly with Australia, you don't show an increase in negativity. So there's this exciting potential that if you feel a dual identity with an inclusive superordinate human identity and the national identity, that you wouldn't show prejudice. That's how we interpreted it in that paper. And of course, that's a super exciting possibility. So we followed it up, and of course, as it often happens, it turns out it's not so positive after all. So despite the inspiring words of Bishop Desmond Tutu, who highlighted, you know, my humanity is bound up in yours, for we can only be human together, we found in subsequent work with Angela Nickerson, but also with Katie Greenaway, and in fact, other people have also found, including some people in this room, that you can't always produce more positive attitudes to immigrants or other minority groups by making salient the human identity and other superordinate identities. For one thing, sometimes when you make salient human identities, the, the advantage group, the perpetrator group, feels that there's less discrimination. So it allows them to deny discrimination. We're all humans together. Okay? And the other issue is that sometimes when you make salient human identities, the disadvantaged group will actually reduce their collective action intentions. So they'll become less militant. But the problem is the advantaged group doesn't necessarily become more supportive and welcoming. So it's like you've made salient human identity. The disadvantaged group is like, whew, we're safe now. And the advantaged group is like, ha ha, I'm going to continue to discriminate. But more seriously, we found in a, in a heap of studies, we just couldn't get a human identity salience manipulation to work the way that you get other social identity salience manipulations to work. Just because you make salient human identity doesn't mean that people will take it on board. They won't necessarily increase their human identification with refugees and immigrants. So we found in at least three studies that the human identity salience manipulation wouldn't work, which led me to think, is feeling like immigrants and refugees are your fellow humans, in fact, part of being a low prejudice person? So the first data set was correlational. Is it the case that humanizing refugees is part of low prejudice, dehumanizing them as part of high prejudice? It's an interesting question, right? Anyways, the other issue that um, then you know, gripped us, if it's not a human identity that's going to predict when you can defuse a toxic national norm or resist it, is it, is it something else?
So in the Australian context, we were well-placed to study resistance to toxic norms because we've been suffering from conservatism for the past 20 years. No, let's try not to be so uh, negative. But <clears throat> certainly in the 1990s, we saw one of the first right-wing populist movements rise to power or rise uh, into the power group with Pauline Hansen's One Nation Party. So as most of you would know, this is a party which openly um, uh, campaigned on an anti-immigration platform. So when she first came to power in the 90s, her maiden speech in the House of Parliament, um, Pauline Hanson, the leader of the party, was to oppose Asian immigration. And recently when she was re-elected to the Senate, her maiden speech was to oppose Muslim immigration. So anti-immigration policies have been a core part of One Nation. From this data in the 1990s, we, we had um, six and 650 um, Australian who identified as white Australians, and we looked at their involvement in the debate. And this is summarized in this paper with uh, Julie Duck, Debbie Terry, and Richard Lalonde. And for the purpose of this talk, I just want to highlight the fact that for the conservatives in this top dot point, what we found was a traditional social identity type story where the white Australians who felt like white Australia was threatened, and they perceived that other Australians were hostile to Asian immigration. These were the ones who were engaged politically in anti-immigration discourse and anti-immigration um, political campaigning. But among the opponents, we found an interesting additional counter-mobilization effect. So people who were more highly educated tended to be involved, and those who supported Asian immigration and perceived low threats to whites. But we also found people who perceived increasing conservatism in Australia were more likely to be involved speaking out against the new conservative movement. In other words, they were counter-mobilizing. The perception that the conservative tide was rising was leading them to become involved on behalf of immigrants and refugees. And I think many of us can personally relate to that, right? So overall, there was a pattern of polarization, but there also was counter-mobilization against the rising tide of conservatism. And that's very interesting. How can we theorize and explain that? Well, with some students of mine, I recently have been working on a chapter in a book about Ali Mogadam's psychology of dictatorship and democracy. So that second dot point there um, is a chapter that summarizes Ali's two most recent books. And um, with my students, um, we put in a chapter in this edited volume around social transformation and change. And in this model, which we're calling Flint, um, factional leadership, intergroup conflict, norms, and time, I wanted to take forward the idea that I mentioned at the start of this talk, that many political norms, far from being a normal distribution, where everyone perceives that Canadians are in favor of immigration, in fact, have an interesting lumpy quality that they can be contested. So that on the left-wing side, people will put forward the view that Canadians are very supportive of immigration. But at least some people on the right-wing side might say, oh, not so much, not so much. And so there, there are what I'm calling lumpy norms, the multimodal norms, that when you ask people how do Canadians feel about immigration, you in fact don't get a consensual report. Some people say one thing and some people say another. And just picking out two data sets from the immigration um, studies in my lab, in that white Australia group in the right-hand column from your perspective, we see that most of the white Australians in the 90s were supporting the new conservative movement, and they perceived that the overall Australian norm for Asian immigration was extremely hostile to Asian immigration. So where one is strongly opposed on a scale from one to seven, they saw the national norm as 2.83. But among the people that didn't support the new conservatives, they saw the norm as at the neutral point of the scale, 3.78. And similarly, in another sample of Queenslanders, the state where I'm from, the 71% of people who thought there were too many refugees in Australia perceived that other Australians agreed with them. So on a scale from 1 to 7, they saw the national norm as 5.8, where 7 is too many refugees. Australians believe that. And the minority who opposed that view saw the Australian norm as neutral. Now, what would create these lumpy norms? Obviously, there's both causes and effects. In this talk, I want to focus on the effects, but just to touch on the causes, because I know some of you are fixated on that. 
Of course, there's a false consensus effect that we would expect. So everyone tends to see that the norms of the group are more like their own norms, right? What do Canadians think? Well, they think what I think, right? But I don't think that's all. There are some other factors that play into it. For example, you might see one side is more located within an echo chamber than the other, right? If you're only talking to people who feel like you, you have an exaggerated false consensus effect. If the media disproportionately reflects your views, then you have an exaggerated false consensus effect, right? Whenever you read the newspaper, you see the headlines that support your views, then you have an exaggerated false consensus effect. And also, you knew I would have mentioned it at some point, but if you're averaging across the descriptive and injunctive norms, what Canadians think and what they should think, you're going to get very different patterns of these lumpy norms. So it might be the case that we all agree that Canadians do support immigration at present, but if you ask what should Canadians do, that's the injunctive norm, that's where you're going to see this maximum lumpiness. So we could talk more about that if there's time, but the important consequence that I'd like to highlight is that as soon as you hear someone say what they think the national norm is, you can infer their politics. So if I say to you, Australians are a nation of immigrants who strongly support welcoming refugees, then you know that I'm left-wing. And if you hear me say, um, you know, Australians take a stand to protect our borders and we want to keep queue jumpers out, then even if you ignore the negative label, you can assume that I'm right-wing. And the reason why that's interesting is because it implies anytime you mention one group's norms, you could make another group's identity salient. So if I say to you, or Donald Trump says, the American people want a ban on Muslim immigration, then you know that the speaker was right-wing, that makes you feel left-wing, and that makes you polarize against this norm. This counter-mobilization that I was talking to where What's happening is not that people are, uh, or not only that people are resisting a national norm, but that these clusters of identities have been made salient, and so that the national norm is actually politicized in this context. What are the implications? Well, we have a whole heap of data in my lab that we've been thinking about on counter-mobilization in prejudice contexts, especially immigration, but also um, racial discrimination. So here's a study from the indigenous Australian context where right, white Australians were reminded of a real discriminatory national norm, so the Northern Territory intervention for those that know Australian politics. And when these white European Australians are reminded of the discriminatory norm, firstly, they feel less happy. So this graph here, oh yes, that's right, you can't see my cursor. Um, the left-hand graph says, in general, what percentage of the time are you happy? And the red bar, the discriminatory norm, once you're reminded of the crappiness of your country, you report that you're less happy overall, something that Americans fully understand now, right? Mm -hmm. But in addition, look at the right-hand bars. This is the proportion of the sample that took advantage of the opportunity within the study to fill in a political form letter. Oh, thank you very much. Fill in a political form letter to oppose the discriminatory policy. And what we see is when the discriminatory norm is made salient, 60% of the politically active respondents filled out this letter to the minister with their contact information and it was subsequently submitted. So the effect of making salient the discriminatory norm was actually to mobilize people against that norm. And here's another case, um, another uh, example of, of right-wing counter-mobilization, specifically around refugees. So in this graph, um, I made salient either welcoming norms or discriminatory norms against refugees in Australia. And what you see on the x-axis is whether people are pro-detention uh, centers, pro-exclusion of refugees, or whether they're in favor of welcoming refugees. And the red bar is the discriminatory norm condition, when you can see that Overall, people who are in favor of refugees in the right-hand bars tended to write letters in both conditions, unlike the other study. And the two left-hand bars show the proportion of people who are more conservative or in favor of detention centers who took political action. And what happened was, if you made salient a welcoming norm, implying that you know, there was bipartisan opposition to detention centers and a growing momentum for change, these conservatives were more likely to take political action to, to, in favor of detention centers, to assert an exclusionary policy. 
So what I'm trying to highlight here is a, a counterintuitive pattern of results for me originally, where across a series of studies, you find these backlash effects of both conservative and egalitarian norms, which for me anyways were difficult to understand. An interesting aspect of this data as well, we had measured hate's moral foundations. Not, not very important to elaborate for this talk, but you can think of them as a kind of conservative values. So we measured these conservative values that participants had. And what we found was if you made salient a discriminatory norm, these values remained, if you like, dormant. They had a mild positive correlation with behavior, but it wasn't significant. But it was when you made salient an egalitarian norm of welcoming asylum seekers, that's where the conservative values were activated and associated significantly with political action. So I find that quite interesting. And Catherine and I have a collaboration with Greg Mayo to kind of try and move forward the values times norm interactions in um, anti-immigration activism. There's other people as well that have published counter-mobilization effects where um, Falomir and colleagues in Switzerland found that if you put forward an egalitarian norm, the Swiss high identifiers became more exclusionary. And um, I alluded to the earlier data on Asian immigration. And I think it's really obvious in the Trump election space. So if you think of the Trump election as in indicating a victory for rising uh, right-wing um, anti-immigration attitudes. What has the effect been? Well, depression, as we saw in the earlier graph, but also people are taking actions, new, new actions, right? So, for example, the safety pin movement, where you publicly identify yourself as someone who's not bigoted. Uh, a sad commentary on the American political space, but a positive gesture. So the idea is if you're afraid of being attacked in the streets and you see someone with a safety pin, you could call out to them as a potential ally. Okay, so in the original social identity approach, the idea was that you would always have only one identity at a time. But I think most of us that have been looking at immigration attitudes would realize that's not the case, and some of these attitudes are more positively correlated than we've thought about in the past. These positively correlated identities would therefore reinforce each other, and that would change the implications for interventions and change. So, for example, um, first, that we can predict counter-mobilization if we assume that making salient a particular representation of the national norm evokes politicized identities with oppositional norms. But in addition, we can understand that the, the architecture, if you like, of these correlated identities is going to have real implications for the intervention in anti-immigration policies. So if we assume as that Whenever we think about refugees or foreigners, it makes salient our national identity, and therefore we conform to national norms, then we're always going to be oriented to trying to change the national norm, and we do that usually by contesting the intergroup appraisals of threat. So are immigrants threatening or not? That's the key point of leverage if we take a traditional social identity approach. But what I find interesting about the clustered identities or correlated identities approach is that we would then start to look in our samples at what the interrelationships are among the different identities and how these different identities are supporting or inhibiting discriminatory norms. So in one early data set from Australia, I found, for example, that if you ask people to rate their national, religious, race, gender, and political identities, for Australian men, all five of these identities go together, Australian, white, Christian, male, right wing. So, they're all positively correlated. The more you identify with any of these identities, the more you identify with the other. In contrast, interestingly for women, there, were two, there was a two-factor solution to their identity architecture with female left wing as the first dimension and Australian white Christian as the second. Now I think, this, firstly, this is in inherently interesting in and of itself, but if we think about what the implications are for changing immigration norms, it implies that we would look at whether there's opportunities for leverage or possibly sources of reinforcement for discrimination in the other identities. So it could be the case that we can look at changing the national norm through these other correlated identities or alternatively that we have to unpack the relationship among these mutually reinforcing discriminatory norms before we can seriously think about change.
Um, I had another section of the talk that I was going to go into, um, but Yolanda's given me a five minute mark, right? How am I going now? Two minutes? Three minutes. Three minutes. Okay, I'm just gonna, I'll tell you the story and then we'll just skip to the graphs. <laughs> With Catherine Amiel, a focus of my research lately has been understanding whether people can be happy and discriminate. So in the humanistic tradition, it's thought to be the case that you really only would be bigoted and discriminatory if you've had some sort of psychic harm, and that by harming others, you harm yourself. Whereas in the social identity approach, in general, we say, no, 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 it's really easy for people to legitimize harm doing. Sometimes people even glorify it, and it becomes fun and positive for you to discriminate. So to make a long story short, Catherine has shown in a whole series of studies that if you just expose people to a new discriminatory norm or a new merit-based norm, people will conform to both, but they conform more to the merit-based norm and they're happier to say that it was their own authentic motivation to do it, whereas they, just, they conform less to the discriminatory norm and they say that it was not their authentic uh, motivation to do it. So if we skip through to some new graphs on immigration discrimination, what we see in this graph is that when people conform to a discriminatory norm, they use this strategy of compartmentalization, which says this is not who I really am, this is just reflects my behavior in this unique context. And they use this strategy even though they're conforming to a new norm, whoops, sorry, in the same way that um, they conform to a new merit-based norm in the other column. Sorry about the colors on your screen, it doesn't look very clear. And I'll just forward ahead to a second study where we replicated this. So whenever people are conforming to a discriminatory norm, um, they're, they're claiming that it's not their true self. Now, in understanding that rationalization, as an opportunity for leverage requires us to know exactly what they're doing. Are they just trying to look good? I don't think so because we found it on an implicit measure. So it's not just about consciously presenting a certain image. If they're somehow distancing a discrimination behavior from themselves, maybe there's an opportunity there to get them to stop doing it. And that's the direction that we're trying to move in in future work is to understand the reason why a new discrimination norm is harder to integrate in the self than a new egalitarian norm. And I interpret it as being about these clustered identities that people already have, that they already have within themselves egalitarian norms. That's why it's hard to introduce discriminatory norms. But the negative consequence of that is that as the right-wing tide sweeps across our political agenda, it should become easier and easier to take on board discriminatory norms. Once we've accepted discriminatory norms against asylum seekers and refugees, is it the case that it's then easier to take up discrimination against gay people, discrimination against women? If they're all completely independent spheres of operation, as traditional social identity approaches might say, then there wouldn't necessarily be a contagion. But both politically and I think theoretically, there's reason to expect that this might be the case, that we could see these toxic effects spreading from the immigration context to other contexts and vice versa. So with that cheery thought, well, let's go straight to our discussions. Thanks. <laughs>